Welcome to Happy Path Programming. I'm Bruce Eckel. I'm James Ward. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Today, I'm excited to have with us Ali Drotbaum. And you, uh, we've interacted for, I don't know, over a decade. You've been up here to Crested Butte to the Java Posse Roundup. You said twice, ago. right? Twice. Yeah, two, 2009, 2012. Actually. Nice. Okay. Awesome. And so great to have you on. You, um, you work on the Spring team currently, right? Yeah, thanks for having me in the first place. Yeah, um, okay. I've been an engineer on the Spring team for over a decade now. So wow. I've done a couple of different things, primarily the Spring data stuff. So all the repository abstractions in there. Yeah. Uh, that's been what I've done with the, a team of four or five people now. Nice. But yeah, I've moved on into some different topics, architecturally related topics recently. Nice. But and that's actually one of the things that I'm really interested in kind of picking sure. your brain about because uh, you've you've done lots of uh, work in domain driven design. Um, yeah, so I mean the the spring data uh, projects or the repository abstraction like like tightly connects to that right uh, There is this concept of a repository in domain driven design. Uh, kind of simulating a collection of aggregates, basically, and mm. being able to select uh, subsets of those aggregates through an API. And um, we've built a Java programming model around this that's yeah. become pretty popular. I think it's the third most downloaded Spring project like oh, within wow. the ecosystem. Wow. Um, okay. So, so to get started, I want first. I want to talk. So this mug. Yeah, um, which our listeners can't see, but our listeners can see. A very nice mug. It but even has your name on it. It has my name on it. So what happened? And this was two. Let's see, 2013. So 10 years ago. Okay. And um, Eric Evans invited a group of us to what he called the DDD Summit, and okay. this was based on some of the events that I had here in Crested Butte because Eric had come to least a couple of them. And he said, oh, I want to do something. I, I see how it works. I want to do something like that around domain-driven design. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went with Barry Hawkins, who uh, at least for a couple of years worked with so, Eric to try and, you know, turn domain-driven design into, I think, I think, I mean, I think they were looking at creating a, a training and consulting firm around it. And I think that what I came away with was that Eric felt at the time that it just, he was disappointed that it hadn't gained traction really? at the time. It wasn't, you well, know. How old is his book? Well, his book had been, so this, the book was before this. So. Oh yeah, the book had been out. Uh, it's some 2003 number. or 2004 actually. Oh, okay. So, so it, the book had been out for like 10 years. And it's like, no, it wasn't taken off, it wasn't taken off. And now... So let's do a summit. <laughs> yeah. Was, well, yeah, maybe maybe that's what he was hoping for. And and I think he did want to ask, you know, all right, you know, what's what should we do about this? It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like maybe what John DeGose has been doing with Scala recently. Yeah. Um, and he, he, he was just, you know, disappointed at its lack of traction. But now it seems like in the last couple of years, probably longer, people are all about domain-driven design. And can you tell us, like, first, like, what is domain-driven design? Well, yes, definitely. What <laughs> I want to hear, like, the... What is, what is the, the basic? Because I, I read, <laughs> you know, little pieces of the book, but not... Yes. I never really immersed myself in it. So, you know, what problem are you trying to solve with domain-driven design? So I can give you the story how I discovered the book, basically. Oh, so I, it's, it's, sure. I think it's... It's been like one of the books that has most fundamentally changed the way I look at building software or, uh, yeah, uh, both on the, let's say, higher level point of views, like how, which systems to build, where are the boundaries, like that kind of stuff. Um, and also on the, let's say, more uh, down to the code aspects, like the, the, the Content, concepts and building blocks um, he, uh, Eric mentions in the book. So there's basically two big parts. Uh, one being the um, strategic design, which is all about like which systems do you actually build, like what scopes do you have, the uh, f uh, famous bounded context notion, um, how they interact with each other, how they relate to each other, like who's controlling like certain parts of the model and kind of those sound like those architectural things. decisions. 
Right, exactly. Okay. So it's kind of that's the that's the bigger uh, systems kind of organization part of it. Um, the book, however, starts with like the concept of ubiquitous language. So uh, trying to put the business language into code and um, also describes a couple of patterns, I'd say, um, that you find in code that, um, yeah, which you p kind of use to organize your code, uh, implement certain ta or responsibilities like uh, like scopes of consistency and whatnot. So it's it's that's the technical uh, design part. Um, and a lot of people actually stop when when they're past this because uh, the book is pretty pretty uh, big actually. Um, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of concepts in it. So yeah, so people often just maybe take the easy ones. And, then... and I, I have to admit, I mean, I've, I've started as a junior developer back in the days, and uh, those patterns were the things that drew me to the book because it was immediately useful for me in my day to day work. Whereas the other stuff is kind of like. Of course, architectural uh, stuff that's important as well. But as as a day to day developer, uh, you're kind of not really in the position put in the position to decide. Okay, we change the whole systems landscape, organize teams around it. Um, but hey, if if I can improve the code that I write to some degree by applying these patterns, that's a win in the first place, right? And that's yeah. that's what kind of uh, drew me to the to the book. So there's almost like a inherent scale to the problems that it's trying to solve is that there are some things that apply to an individual developer on a team and can be very useful in that context and then there's other concepts that would apply kind of more to some someone in a architecture role that is working with many teams and thinking about the the system as a whole and that sort of thing with that it, it, exactly i mean it's it's a kind of a holistic view or like approach to software development and it allows you to like depending on what kind of your role is in an organization or as a consultant um, and what kind of people you talk to you can always find something to kind of uh, improve the current situation whether that's like a messy code base and you try to like organize that a bit but if you're like talking to teams or um, the HR department that ha is kind of setting up the teams f to actually solve problems overall then you rather like try to fine tune uh, those like with all the Conway's law stuff and what what have you, right? So it's 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 kind of it's such a big thing that you always find something that you can take forward to like improve the software you build. So yeah. So can um, you give us the essence of? I mean, may, I don't know. Maybe we should start at the mm -hmm. individual programmer level. How how what? How does that change? How what 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 mindset changes do you experience when you're coding? Um, so so what it did to, for me was that uh, or the, the the key piece was that kind of you have this ubiquitous language, and to be able to connect to the business and eventually provide value, you have to talk the language of the problem um, or the problem space, and by that the people that are busy with the problem space. So I was like really into uh, naming things, right? How do you find good names? How do you how do you make sure that the the gap between the problem and the code is as small as possible? And mm. that's kind of to find the right abstraction levels, um, getting away from like technical concepts to let's say more higher level concepts. Um, to yeah, because that was like the promise of object-oriented programming, right? We can create our objects to represent problem domain things. Sh sure, and I mean, the, the different languages like give you different opportunities to like do that, right? To build, I'm not saying DSLs, but rather like write code that has has expresses the the, the problem domain. Uh, but this, I at least like in the code bases that I see at customer projects, for example, there's often a lot of room for improvement to actually do that, to just mm. basically name things better and by that make things more expressive. Um, there is this this great talk by Dunberg Jonsson, um, uh, the value objects talk. I, th I think if you if you Google it on, on this and one on InfoQ. I'll find it and put it in the- InfoQ has a, has a recording. I, I can find out the link. Where he basically takes a, a code base that's very technical and driven by frameworks and what have you. Um, it's about like money exchange and exchange rates. And he just adds tiny things like value objects to the code base and ends up with a piece of code that's just like reads like the actual problem statement. And that's even huh. Java, right? So it's kind of like, it's not like the most- 
the most convenient language to build, let's say, um, an API that's not like with curly braces and what have you. You don't have all that 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 powerful uh, language syntax uh, that you have in Kotlin, for example, right? With where you can much more shape the 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 that text that you have to write to yeah the data modeling there's kind of more ceremony like maybe in java for yeah, yeah. the data model right well, now when you say value object is that yeah. could that be like well for example i mean the languages that i'm studying now have a focus on immutable data structures mm -hmm. is that is that what you would call a value object yeah sh sure i mean it's like representing domain concepts that are values and mm -hmm. that allow you to like perform a certain like not not business operations, but again speak the language of the business. Let's say that's the classic example of an email address, right? It's not just an arbitrary string that you carry through the system, but it's actually it has follows some structure. It's it a has type. a local part, it has a server part, and you can access those and you can do things to that. And if you hand this over to some other piece of code, that other piece of code can be sure that it's structurally an email address. It's not just an arbitrary string. But it's it's that particular domain concept, right? It's, you don't have to validate it anymore. Um, you get right. that you actually just use the type system to express domain concepts. So mm -hmm. let the compiler help you, like check the um, the correctness of your of your application code and, and convey to people reading the code what the business yeah. <laughs> oriented sure. side of it sure. is. Yeah. And not have these just like stringly typed method parameters, like string first name, string last name, string email address, and then you mix up the, the order of that stuff. Yeah. I'd rather have like explicit like name class or an email address class or whatever. That's, so is the is the essence of this that we have business needs that we're trying to address? How do we map those business needs to the code that we're actually writing in a way that that has cohesion and it also sounds like what some people have been calling data structure oriented design hmm, i haven't heard that one because yeah. i mean it's when you have the immutable data structures and you go well what should they be they should be something that relate well at least maybe my interpretation is they should relate to the problem domain so your data structure should be something somebody can look at and go oh yeah that's those are the pieces that we want to manipulate hmm. the, the, the data structures like the the term, at least in the Java world, it's a bit of a tricky one, because um, it's it it data structure is usually understood as something where you have like getters and setters, like this Java Bean concept on it, mm -hmm. which kind of is a bit subverting the some ideas of of DDD because you you wouldn't want to expose those internal structures to your calling code, but rather basically capture state when you create an instance, and then that instance is able to answer questions around the domain rather than basically handing out all the the the, the uh, values that it consists of so the encapsulation um, idea exactly so that's that's also a, re a reason that records that have been like right. added quite recently to the java language they are a bit of a uh, um a special thing here so some people really dislike them for exactly that that fact that they kind well, of because it goes them. against what they including me have been taught um, all this time is, oh, you want to have variables inside of these data structures and you want to protect them through encapsulation, et cetera. This idea of a record where everything is exposed is definitely a mind shift. But once you see it, then you go, oh, yeah, we don't actually need encapsulation if we've got immutable data structures. It's it's kind of a neat a neat tool where you for it's especially like these the single value objects like an email address or what have you where mm -hmm. you at some point especially at the boundaries of your application you need the raw value again right if you want to like serialize it into some JSON or what have you or have to actually put it into some database column um, but you you actually get or you are able to express the concept in a very concise way so that you can then have that particular type that you carry around. That's matching uh, the business requirements of basically just the email address format. Uh, whereas, like before records, you'd have to um, create a class, final field, constructor equals hash code, write all this down, or let basically let have your IDE uh, write this all in into your or uh, use an external editor. tool like and whatever that, that. That's causing a lot of Mom boilerplate, Mom which Mom then Mom. in turn caused people not like using these classes because it's just yes. so much boilerplate code, right? So, exactly. Um, and it's leaking, I, I it's, it's leaking some of the 
um, system needs into the business domain space, which I think domain driven design is trying to say that no, let's let's keep our business domain focused on the business domain. Sure. And exactly. at some point, yes, you need to take that object and serialize it. And there's different system needs that may come into play, but let's keep that as like a separate concern. Separate. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, I guess it's kind of, you kind of have to get a feel for when using a record is like, or that record concept in Java is, is the right thing for simple values. It's perfectly fine. It's just that if you basically try to, let's say you have your entire customer modeled as a record, just because it's immutable, then it's kind of still, yeah, I don't know. Um, it, it's a it's a definitely a mental shift but mm -hmm. once i mean once i started seeing i'm going oh yeah of course of course if i was to ever rewrite um one of my java books it would be records unless you're forced yeah. to not use records and usually that's only uh, uh an efficiency issue yeah so an example I mean, of this is maybe um you you can i think often maybe pre domain driven design and and adoption of that oftentimes your data layer would model how you needed to store the data in the database and somebody would look at your data layer and be like if somebody was looking at it from the business perspective be like why is it organized like this mm -hmm. and the answer would be oh that's because that's how the database needs it to be organized um but in domain driven design you say no let's keep the layer for the business oriented totally around the business needs and business domain and then we can transform from that layer to the the database the way that the database needs the, the data actually stored right and if you use a different kind of database then you use then you can change your transformation it's not hardwired without having to change into the, the structure yeah, yeah i guess that's the the heart of what you just said is the is like hidden in these or is also represented in these like onion architecture and hexagonal architecture approaches where you have your core domain that really focuses on like trying to write as pure as possible code that represents the domain. And then you have some kind of adapters or uh, mm -hmm. like rings in onion architecture that translate that into like the infrastructure, right? Into the database or, or the UI, the way that the or UI the API or uh, basically or the API. Yeah, yeah. The UI. Yeah. Yeah. So what now early i can't remember the phrase you used but you were saying okay we want everything to map to um you know as much as possible the the business domain mm -hmm. um what about like in functional programming we have all of these kind of well for functional it's low level primitive things like the map and the fold and the things like that which allow us to not um or Basically, it allows for greater code reuse and greater reliability. You know, we're not having to write everything by hand. We're writing at a slightly higher level. But it uh, does that mm, intrude on some of the ideas in domain-driven design, or are they compatible? It, that's an interesting question because I've 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 come across this quite a lot when um, I've seen projects and also also uh, like. The projects I've been involved with have used libraries called Wa or like Waver. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. I am not familiar. It's, it's basically a, trying to um, transport some of the concepts you have in Scala into Java, like a tri monad, <laughs> and, okay. and it kind of it nudges you to write uh, a bit more functional code in in Java. Um, and I've 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 used that in a couple of projects to to some success. So it's 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 all working fine. The effect it has on the code is a bit of a like a. I think I'm a bit torn on this one because you introduce a language that's familiar to us as developers, like as you said, uh, Bruce, with like the folds and the maps and what have you. That's not necessarily the language of the domain. In fact, it could even exactly. it could even it could even f uh, like shadow concepts of the domain if you t if mm. just the method of filter. Like if you talk to a, a to a um, um, someone uh, from the chemistry domain, right? Is that when, when you say filter, do you describe what you try to keep or what you want to <laughs> let through? Right? Yeah, so that's kind of inclusion. There's there's a there's a just having that additional language in there um, can be like beneficial to people understanding that language and the technical language, but at the same time, it's also a bit alien to 
business code to some mm-hmm. degree. So um, yes, that's that really the, my question. That the names yeah. the names are oriented around the actual like uh, mathematical concepts, mathematical basically. concepts, not oriented around the business. And yeah, because you talked about the common language, and so that's what made me think. Okay, I mean, really, yes. When you're using a filter, you say, "All right, the essence of the filter is not the action of filtering, which is standardized and debugged, but this little, usually lambda or whatever function we pass that describes what we're filtering for." And so that, you know, I think you could say, "Okay, that's the language of the domain," but you're just not used to having these these higher level tools that functional yeah. programming provides for you or the error handling um, models that functional programming use. I think the error handling one is a really interesting example because if in your domain model you're getting the data from a database or a microservice or whatever, then that's something that may fail. And do you put like the try monad into your business domain when the business domain doesn't care at all that the thing failed, right? It's just, yeah. a, and so that's, that's, it seems like a place where it could easily leak in, where you're leaking in the, the actual technical details into the business domain. <laughs> what I found quite useful, and it's often, or that's also actually coming from DDD, and I see a lot of people like, um, not doing that is kind of m- modeling these error scenarios as explicit as part of the domain, right? So, mm. uh, not trying to okay, there's an exception mm. or anything, or even a, like a, a, a try, like an error result. It's just that okay, the let's say the request, the account request is just in some particular state that uh, it it that is like erroneous that that someone has to look at it or we have to perform some actions on it but it's actually that error state is a valid state within the application right yeah. or within the software application not the contract application for example yeah. um so that that often like does a does a bit of a or is a bit of a switch in 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 how, how people can think about stuff and not try to Oh, there's this exception that we throw, and then we handle this some place, and we just display a message to the user, and then they have to have to deal with it. But rather, okay, this thing is it has a new state that represents a problem, right? So that's yeah. kind of yeah. Doomful. Or you look something up. Yeah, I mean, you look up the name of a user, and that may not exist, and that's a legitimate thing in your business domain. Yeah, oh, sure. We we thought, or we we looked up. Um, the user, and oh, they don't have an account. Well, that's a totally yeah. legitimate. The, the example I, I usually give there is like if you have, let's say, an, an e-commerce application and you have to keep track of s- stock of products, right? And then mm-hmm. there's, there's, of course, this easy way to say, oh, I have four TVs in my inventory and someone wants to order five, so I throw an exception and basically say, you can't order these five TVs, but Mm-hmm. What if we just like model this as a, like a perfectly valid state, and then draw some conclusions from that 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 overdraw, right? So basically, say, okay, uh, dear um, uh, people, we we have to basically reorder stock, right? So make turn this into a signal that after like you you cross a certain threshold, um, you'd have to do other business activity to solve that problem. Cool. Right. So it's yeah. So, um, and it seems like the the easy naive approach is just to throw the exception exactly. and let the caller deal with it. The yeah. the but that's not necessarily in line with what the business needs are because it could very well be that the business actually wants the person to place that order, and yeah, sure. that, I mean, and that then they want to, like you said, have other business um, strategies to then to then rectify the problem or something. Mm-hmm. That's that, that, that's exactly the point, right? We, we want to I want to get the developers back to. Uh, realizing, oh, there is a, I mean, in this problem, there's a business opportunity or at least some discussion to be had. Yeah. That, what should, what does the business want to do in this scenario? <laughs> should we really reject that order? Like, and why? And isn't there an opportunity for us to actually improve? We can sell you three now and then the others yeah, will yeah, come yeah. because we're going to order them. Yeah. 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 I, I think this is, it's so valuable to in the world has shifted in for developers 
it used to be long ago, 20 years ago, when I was writing a bunch of business systems, that there was the business, there was the business analyst, and then there was me, the developer. And that business analyst was responsible for translating, uh, discovering and translating the requirements of the business to a specification that then I would go implement. And it seems like that business analyst role has in some ways evaporated. And now it's the developer who is having to understand what the business needs are and implement them more directly. And maybe domain-driven design is the best way for developers to to create that cohes- cohesion across that. The movie Office Space was so pressing <laughs> here because they had the guy who kept explaining, yeah, I take the requirements from the business people and then I bring them to, to the, the, developer. to exactly. the developers. There's your yeah, there's business your, analyst. There's yeah. your business Wait, analyst. Right? I have people skills. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't that at the heart of the like agile software development movement? So it's like developers talking to business people and in collaboration, basically build stuff that's useful. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of them throwing them over the wall and saying, "Yeah, hey, build this." And wait, well, that's what, not what I imagined that it was going to exactly. be. Exactly. Like. The reason why I think that role has evaporated is because it was like the telephone game where there was this, you know, loss of information as you worked through that chain. And it, we've, I think, through agile and domain-driven design, discovered that oh let's just, instead of playing the telephone game, let's just have the developers addressing the business. We'll just give the developers the people skills to talk to <laughs> the customers. I mean, That'll I guess that's, that's, that's the role of modern business analysts, right? To, 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 to foster that translation and that, that mm-hmm. communication. So that I think approaches. there's still, still room for that skill, especially as like often developers are not that, that skill that, and that, uh, but in, in, in well, and the oftentimes we... the business domains are incredibly complex. Sure, and sure, yeah, right. asking always asking the developers to fully understand the business domain can has its yeah. own challenges. Yeah, that's work. Yeah. So, did we miss any big pieces of domain driven? Well, design? no. Or, I have no? a question. Okay. I have a question. So I I feel like we've mostly kind of danced around the low level stuff. Sure. But now I want to know. All right. So. From an architectural standpoint, how do you attack, how do you approach uh, a project from a DDD standpoint? How do you like start architecting such a thing? Oh, whoa, that, that's a that's a broad question, right? Because like, you, you, depending on like what what kind of role you're in and like what what stuff you're looking at, what what the context is in, in which you have to develop the application. Um, what I what I usually do when I'm I'm getting uh, like involved in in customer projects and they um, they ask me to help them architect any kind of software is that I let them present their functional decomposition. Uh, first, so like, what are the big pieces? What does your what does your system look like from in, from like functional uh, separation point of view, right? Uh, you often get like C four model architecture diagrams from from uh, Simon Brown's um, C four model. That oh, is, I don't, like um, it. don't know that, that one. Um, and that um, kind of helps. Is this you like a way to describe the business? The, the the business objectives and what they want from the system or what they've built I mean, with the system. I guess I mean I, I just like basically started from uh, the discussion from oh there's an existing system point of view right if you want to help me uh, understand that if you start from scratch then I of course think you have to look at the organization and the, what what kind of teams you already have mm-hmm. and what what are they working on that might give you not like an ideal situation but just the the, the state of of the uh, of the system you have and then the question of okay what do we actually want to build right so what's what's the kind of thing. Uh, what what business value do we want to provide, and how does that fit in, fit into the current arrangement? Because I mean, so you're uh, trying to work any, any with that, Conway's law, then? Yeah, I mean, it's, you, you try to align with that, right? Because there's no point in 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 being at odds with that, and there's hardly any real greenfield development at all anywhere. Because I mean, just a week after you have started, then you kind of just change. No longer greenfield, and, yeah. Um, but that's kind of that's kind of um, the 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 idea here, and and it, it's it's of course it's a process, right? It's not something you oh, here's the thing, the way you do that. Uh, it's you you could 
uh, there's like uh, Brandolini, uh, Alberto Brandolini's event storming, right? To to understand what the business is doing and then trying to find those those individual pieces, uh, get to the bounded context, basically um, areas of business of the business domain that have to be um, conflict free in terms of the, their language. Uh, so when I say order and you say order, we mean the same thing. But if Bruce says order, he might mean something different. Um, and then you kind of feel, uh, get a feel for where the boundaries are or where you could put them in place reasonably well. So because it's, yeah. especially if you're new to a domain, then it's always like a bit of guesswork involved. And then it's just, I guess, a, a, a question of, how to establish the boundaries in a way that they that you can basically good fences make good neighbors right you you put them in 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 place first but might be able to also tweak and alter them um in in uh, like in a reasonable way so that it's not as expensive yeah. um so a, like, so an example of this i like the order one is that if you if you don't define your boundaries and uh, the context that you're that everyone has seen different things through. Ultimately, what you're going to get is an order object that some of the fields are for this business unit, some of the fields are for this business unit, and some of the fields are for this business unit. And domain-driven design would maybe say that that's a red flag that you haven't bounded the context well. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, the, the the example is pretty great because that uh, because you, um, if you naively look at this stuff, and I mean, I've been guilty, or I am still guilty of this myself, because when I build example projects, they are usually very simplistic, right? And then you have your order, and then you have your inventory, and then you have your catalog with your products. So it's very entity centric, and you're very because that's okay. The, my domain is very simple, right? My product has a price, and that's it. Whereas in the real world, it just isn't as simple, right? Pricing <laughs> yeah. is can be the most complex thing in the world. And you have like tons of different aspects playing into this. And then the entire pricing and product thing could become a, a separate bounded context. Yeah. Um, the for it's it's usually like shipment and invoicing that all touch order and customer to some degree, <laughs> right? They all have a different a particular view on the order right invoicing is interested in, in tax rates shipment is interested in the dimensions right. of the product boxes or what have you but not in tax rates so yeah. um you, you so get if you talk to different this... different teams within an organization they're going to exactly. have different needs on what an order is to them exactly. and so in domain driven design you you design you don't you don't try to assimilate all of that into a Uber order object, you instead say, this is the order object for what this team needs. And this is the order object for what this team well, needs. Well, I would think there would also be an essence of an order object that is going to be the same common for every team. And then when they get that, they go, oh, I'll embed it in our thing and we'll do our stuff with it. And then when we're ready to pass it on, we just take the embedded part and pass it on to you is that there, there usually is, is like one of these like systems or like parts of the system that kind of establish the identity of something and then the other like systems or parts of the system refer to that identity so that you can of course correlate the different ideas of an order quote unquote to the same logical thing mm. um but i've seen like projects where you didn't ha even have like any kind of shared information at all it's just like all just an identifier and then everyone else has their um has their um the, the info that they need and then just like in an eventually consistent way exchange oh i've done an update to some to that thing that i have and everyone else is just pulling out the things that the, the, the aspects that they that they are interested in because there usually of course is some overlap that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to kind of use a shared data structure or anything like that. And all um, of this should be tangential to the actual storage mechanism that's required by different parts of the system. Sure. And I, I, I think that that's probably an, a, an important shift for me in what I've gone through is I would initially long ago design a system about how I wanted to store the data. And with domain driven design, it says, no, start with the business needs and then and then figure out how 
each piece of that needs to actually store the data or pass it to another system or whatever may be presented. Because, because if you do that, you can then actually do what you wanted to do in the first place. Choose the best data store for the problem at hand, yeah. right? So whether it's a relational database, some document store or graph database, if you yeah. need to do recommendations or what have you. So the um, argument is, as which is, I, I came across this recently because the argument is, oh, well, this allows you to change the database. And people were going, you know what? That never happens. Yeah. So that's not a good, but it sounds like it's a, the better argument is, okay, we're, we're abstracting that away so that we don't get muddled up with those details when we're talking about the concepts from the business standpoint. It really seems like we're trying to bring programmers away from all the, you know, low level stuff that they think about in terms of solving this problem and just educating them in, Hey, you're solving a real problem for a real person. And we should keep, we should talk about that problem in those contexts. And it the, seems like that's kind of what it is. I mean, th that this coupling, uh, decoupling discussion is something that, that comes up uh, in a lot of discussions I have with teams because, um, of course, I mean there is this this notion in domain driven design that you we had that discussed this before uh, that you want to like be in the, you have your pure domain code and then you would want to at at the boundaries of your application you kind of map that into some infrastructure right into some database um, at the same time and and onion architecture for example kind of suggests that you have this outer ring and then in in that ring you have your APIs that produce JSON and you have your database that let's say map onto a database table. Um, I, I don't really like that picture too much because there's a significant difference in the translation mechanisms. As you said, Bruce, uh, in, in recent applications, um, the application team usually also owns the data store, right? And there is mm. a, there is a, a direct connection or you can actually make a more direct connection to that data store. You can simplify the mapping. You can even, let's say, go ahead and avoid an inter inter uh, an additional layer of mapping because that all also comes with, with complexity. Um, mm. Whereas let's say for the API, right? If you, if you expose something to third parties, you're not controlling that other model, right? That, that, that thing. And you, you can't like arbitrarily change it. Whereas, um, if I have a customer and the customer has a first name and the last name, then I want to have my table to have a customer and the last name field. I don't want any kind of mapping in between so that the thing in the database could be called something different because that's all just like cognitive overload that mm -hmm. I have to deal with then, right? So I want these models to be close from, from some point of view. I still want to make sure that I can use my domain code without the database running, without the database uh, in place. But that's a different that's a different kind of aspect of of the decoupling like discussion, right? And um, I, I definitely think that you can have different trade offs depending on whether it's the target the target model is something that you control or something that you don't control in the in the API mm -hmm. case for which it probably make, makes a bit of sense to have an additional mapping step in between. Um, but at the same time, of course, if you have the customer has a first name and a last name, um, there will be a first name and the last name field in the in the JSON representation, right? So yeah, uh, it's kind of a it's a more subtle discussion than like oh we our domain is pure and then we decouple this completely from our database because you yeah. go too far with with trying to create isolation when you may not need it <laughs> yeah and as the, I, I basically i took this off from from bruce's comment about the um we want to exchange the database was, was it you bruce or was it oh uh, you might change the database and yeah then... that's, that's that's hard that's not not really it's not going to happen anyway and if, right. if you if you build your system in that way then you're also losing out a lot on the actual capabilities of the specialized yeah. thing that you actually selected in the first place right, right? Yeah. you select the graph database because you want to make use of the nature of the store it's a fundamental architectural decision exactly yeah and it's mm. it's it's not something i mean you could change you could argue that you would want to exchange one um graph database for another or one, or one relational yeah. database for um, another but if that's the if activities like these 
are or, or, or if, if these are the the main tasks you have to perform on a day to day basis, you're not probably going to earn any money, right? So you're yeah, not, that's you're not, not that's you're not, not the delivering thing business you value want to necessarily <laughs> optimize for solving a different rather problem, yeah. being able to ship features, right? That's mm-hmm. that's kind of the, yeah. the thing. Um, so anyway. um, I want to shift to microservices and monoliths, but I think oh, there's yeah. a good connection here because on Twitter over the last, I don't know, a few weeks, there's been, again, the monolith versus microservices thing has, has come up and it seems to be an ongoing debate. What I'm curious on is from your perspective, how does domain driven design impact the architectural decisions around monoliths for, versus microservices? Is there is there a valuable connection here or are they two kind of separate things to think about? Mm. I mean, there are a couple of things in uh, in domain driven design, a couple of concepts that guide the uh, the potential separation of a logical system into different lo- logical parts, like bound contexts on top, as we discussed already. Uh, they are there's a concept of a module that's kind of a subdivision of uh, a bounded context. So each bounded context can consist of different logical modules that help just help you to define something that's hidden inside and something that's exposed to other modules. And then you can get to these kind of cohesive elements. Um, there's domain driven design does not like um, form an opinion on what to map those to those logical concepts to whether a bounded context is supposed to be a system, a, a separate process. Uh, it could be a, Build module, it could be whatever a module could be a Java package or something. If if we're sticking to, to Java, that the that's that's based that's ex- exactly or that's actually architectural work, right? To decide yeah. like what physical abstractions, if you if we can talk <laughs> uh, it's, uh, about sure, yeah. physics in, uh, in in software uh, or or physics yeah. um, physical, physical world. Yeah. <laughs> but on on each of these like levels processes build modules uh let's say something smaller like packages you just you have live on with with different trade-offs of what you can and cannot do anymore um and so as an like, example of this um let's say that you're designing a system and you've got inventory in order i think that's a, a mm-hmm. good system and yeah. you you design it where that is all within a bounded context. And so then in your implementation, you end up having in the same relational database uh, tables that represent both of those things. Mm -hmm. And in some pieces of your application, you do a database join across those two tables. Mm -hmm. That breaking those two things out into separate microservices becomes really challenging. And I think that maybe- Counterproductive. Yeah, part of the- value of domain driven design in this is that it tells you where you can split things out because you've bounded the context and you've said okay these two things are intertwined we're doing a database join on these things on the actual implementation side and so do not try to break your bounded context apart that would be a bad place to try to do well and from a management context it also would help you decide uh, maybe teams working on things like if you had a remote team in a different time zone working on a different section you'd want maybe that would be your um uh you know your api interface Mm -hmm. that you want and those people would just you know they would focus on that thing anyway yeah yeah, no sure uh it's it's this I, i guess there's like two primary drivers behind like physical separation one is and that's the the bigger one, even I think it's organizational uh, <laughs> boundaries, right? A team, which kind of means team structures and also um, deployment um, cycles, basically, from more, yeah. f- more from an organizational point of view rather than from a technical deployment uh, point of view. Yeah. And the other one is uh, scaling, usually, right? If you have, let's say, in that e-commerce system, um, if you see that the catalog, just the browse, browsing the catalog is like... You, um, under heavy load, then you would might want to consider to have a separate system for that, so that you can basically uh, cover the read load there. There's other options for that as well. You could try caches for these particular URIs or what have you. It's not necessarily, or it, it's not a necessary thing. Um, 
to 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 separate that part out if you if you see that problem. But the organizational um, arrangement usually is a big driver for that physical separation. Everything else, and we actually see kind of a bit of a a trend back to that is um, is something or. or we see the trend to people building what what we call modulithic software these days, right? Modulithic. So, yeah, that's right. kind of like yeah. okay, you, you build something in a in in a that's a single process that still has some internal structure, and that that applies actually some means that you would have to apply if you separated it out, but you wouldn't usually don't if you basically keep it contained because. It also uh, means a bit like um, giving up on some convenience stuff, like you mentioned, um, uh, James. The, the that stuff like interconnected database tables, right? You could you could go ahead and still cleanly separate like the data of your let's say order module and the order uh, the the data of your inventory module, and make sure that you let's say just have a store let's say the order ids or product ids or what have you but without a foreign key relationship right. so that you still get to get the connection but if you at some point decide to actually uh, to pull out that part of the system then you are, are already prepared and um uh, you have your data layer basically prepared um that basically that continues into the the way that these individual logical modules interact with each other whether it's like direct method calls or whether it's like an event that's published on one side of the system and then listened to by the other that would not necessarily have to be that case or it have to be that way um, in a in let's say in a monolithic arrangement, but we we already do so because we want to basically establish these logical boundaries within our system, um, our monolithic system, because it makes the system easier to test or parts of that mm -hmm. easier to test. Um, it's I'm, I'm basically what I'm. What yes, I'm it is the, this the bounded uh, context. Go ahead. Does the bounded context idea help us to decide? Uh, what pieces potentially could be split off and, and for team reasons or, or runtime performance reasons or whatever it may be. To, yeah. But is, it, is there a connection there? I mean, you, you could, you could play, let's say a, a very or reasonable, like I'm not saying default mapping, but you could argue, okay, whatever, what, what, what forms the bounded context we build as a, as a separate system because we align a team around it. Um, and that's not like everything order or everything inventory as we, as we, just already discussed. But that bounded context might have like an internal structure that we then represent as individual modules. And then we have, again, like a mapping step onto either build modules or um, as we have in this in this um, new spring project here, the spring modulus stuff, uh, we use packages quite a lot, right? We, we basically say that uh, there's a Java package that forms the entry point into a module and uh, we give you a, a few guardrails or uh, means to actually make sure that this modular structure that you've created by just arranging your code in a certain way um, is, is uh, you, you retain that and you're not accidentally introducing like cycles. I, yeah, I want to hear more about this because I think I saw a little bit and it seemed really interesting. But this is the idea that you're building a, a spring project and you're architecting it, organizing it in a way that is able to be modularized later. And, and you it doesn't impact you as the developer. Like you, you're not having to, the, the developer experience around creating something that's modular and packaged uh, is nice versus the traditional way was that, oh man, like now you got to think about, you know, how you're going to share your interfaces and the contract and how you do contract testing and all this kind of stuff. Is that, I mean, yeah. So the, the the idea of the of the project is that you can build a Spring Boot application. That's what what it's based on, and that you get the as a developer you get the ability to express these logical parts. Mm -hmm. And you would use Java packages as to do that on a on a let's say the most high high level. Um, yeah. What what you get with it is means to in from this from, from these packages is to expose certain APIs like. In his Spring Beans, which is like object instances at runtime that you can invoke, or um, events that basically are published through the Spring Event Bus 
within yeah. the JVM. So it's not not kind of no messaging at all involved mm. yet, yeah. or at this point at least. Um, you get that, and um, what you get around this is both an ARC unit based API to uh, verify that you have a non cyclic structure, and mm. if you want to. Uh, and express, like, let's say, this module is allowed to only depend on that other, you would be able to do that as well. But as we've seen, a simple non-cyclic arrangement already gives you kind of 80% of the of the kind of um, structural degradation prevention, basically. Yeah. Um, you, you get the verification, and what you also get is the ability to bootstrap individual modules within that system in a test so that you can mm -hmm. just say, okay, I want to only run the order module, for example. Um, and um, it would then basically just limit the execution to, to those beans and, and what have you. So it's a very, very uh, non-invasive way for developers to yeah, just structure your applications. Um, non-invasive because everything that's complicated usually puts people off. Yeah. Right? You want to, do, we want to be, uh, be able to do the right thing in a very easy way. To, yeah. to, um, so like OSGI, but actually like usable yeah. and friendly. I mean, and... there's there's been a lot of discussion, yeah. and it's, there's still questions that come up with like uh, also around JPMS and uh, OSGI yeah. is also another thing. But if you look at those, especially JPMS has been built to to modularize the JDK. Uh, it's very security focused, and uh, you need to the libraries to to play uh, to play into this. Right, they have to provide this. None of none of this is usually the the at the concern of the developers in the first place. If you <laughs> yeah. again, you have your domain. It's what the right? system needs, not what application. not what the developer needs. I, I want I want to structure my application following the domain, and I don't necessarily want each module of that to be a separate jar file, which is what JPMS would require. Yeah. So it's yeah. It's just here's my boot app. I just lay out the logical parts, the the business driven parts, in a certain way. Um, and that's all I care about for now, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it, it kind of leaves away a lot of the complexity it, it, by also not being like as as deep, or it, it's not like yeah. that as deeply ingrained, of course, yeah, in the uh, in, in the JVM. But it it does the trick. So there's a bigger bang for the buck kind of ratio here. Yeah. Um, and it's. It's kind of that that project is basically a technical implementation of stuff that we have conveyed through like presentations or in consultings. Uh, oh, go ahead, structure your application like this. Put your configuration code in. Uh, do it like this. Right? All these recommendations that we've verbally verbally given are kind of now embedded or in, yeah. implemented. What's the name of the project in, again? Uh, Spring Modulith. Basically, spring um, modulith. Cool. Modulith. Yeah, we yeah. want to help help you build modulistic application mm -hmm. uh, applications, and that doesn't mean. I mean, there's, there's always this discussion about uh, modulith being so close to monolith. Do we tell you to build a single application? No, we don't. It's just a means to whatever system you build, whatever arrangement that is part of, it is likely to have some internal structure, yeah. and. Um, we want to help you to express that internal structure and then give you guidance around uh, tests. There's um, mm. observability features in there because in a microservices arrangement, you'd usually put something like Zipkin mm -hmm. between the systems to be able to track the the flow through the mm -hmm. through the through the individual systems. Why shouldn't you have something available in your modulithic application, right? So that you can mm. track that the order module invokes the inventory or what have you track the number of events that get published um all this 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 kind of stuff um that's that's kind of exposed to any any runtime platform so in the microservices versus monoliths the answer is yes both and it's called moduliths and sure. also it's, it's, there's this quote from from Stefan Tirkov. He said, "Like uh, we like monoliths so much that we would want to build many of them, uh, and that's <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of the spirit, right? So it's not about like yeah. one system or a thousand systems. It's like okay, you align the the number of systems with your organizational structure, and mm. you still have means to organize within those systems because, like in in the public discussion, it's usually like oh, this there's this system." 
And if it's a microservice, then that's the, the level of granularity and there's nothing in there. It's like just this one thing, which is usually not the case, right? It's like yeah. um, you can yeah. rather build a slightly bigger thing that has internal structure. Um, so embrace Conway's law. Don't fight it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. It sort of seems like I, I would kind of sum this up by saying that domain-driven design, well, we make these decisions when we're programming. And because of our training and our orientation, we make them purely for technical reasons for within our own little world. What domain-driven design does is it says, ah, I can give you information to help you make better decisions, to produce better results, to produce more maintainable, understandable, et cetera, results. That seems like yeah. kind of what we're going yeah, for yeah. here. Sounds like yeah. the value proposition of domain-driven mm -hmm. design. I, I, it's almost like a system of thinking. It is. And giving you a lens to see things through that should help you deliver better business outcomes for what you're building. But my question that I kind of pitched at you at the beginning was, why why is it big now when it's been 20, 20 years, years yeah. since the book got written? What's I, changed? I mean, there definitely is a renaissance of, of that. I mean, I've been starstruck by the book like from the, from the very beginning and that led to spring data repositories and what have you. But uh, I think that, that microservices discussion, like the, the hype that kind of we've seen like five years ago at the peak with Netflix, thousands of systems and what have you, that kind of got people rethinking about like, where do we put boundaries, right? And like, mm. Do we want to have like two levels of abstraction or do we want to have multiple ones? And which which quality goals do we align with which level of abstraction, right? This kind of organizational stuff at the bound context level um, and, and this boiling down and how much freedom do we want or do we need in terms of like the choice of technology and what have you, right? Like mm -hmm. do we want to use different programming languages and if we want to do so, we have to do processes. All these discussions have started with it, with the with the uh, microservices uh, movement, um, and it's. I think it's an important piece. Also, is that microservices is the has been the first architectural style, new architectural style, post the agile uh, software huh. development mm. kind of huh. um, development. So it's uh, so it it it. it it's it's breathing that that kind of that kind of idea or that energy because you would want to align your microservices with your business capabilities, right? It's kind of mm -hmm. they seem to ha have the same roots to some degree. Um, all these 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 movements, one being the organizational or process side of things, and the other one being the technical implementation idea. Um, yeah, but, like waterfall was much more aligned with monoliths conceptually. Yeah, yeah, and, sure, because you you have a project and you build one system to satisfy one project, right? This is kind of yeah. it's been that, that idea. Um, and all this kind of like centered around like different teams doing different things and then yeah. aligning the software structures with that um, has definitely like, or there's, there's some connection there. And I think that especially the strategic design part of, of DDD that we kind of like just briefly touched on today uh, kind of connects to that, right? And then that's kind of, oh, there's this book. And let's let's see what ideas were in there, and then people are coming back to kind of realizing that it's not necessarily about like the technical implementation mm -hmm. of microservices, but rather about like modularity and different different scopes of modularity at different levels of abstraction yeah. that are and like, the and the interface between that and the and the actual structure of the organization. Yeah, yeah, sure, and yeah, and did, did the, especially the blue book making exactly that connection. I mean, the partners' yeah. paper is from what seventy nine or something, so it's not particularly. What was even, the even the DVD book is kind of a like a. Um, a what was late, the paper you mentioned? From uh, the partners' paper, modularity paper. Oh, huh. I have to read that one. I don't hmm. know that one. Do you know this one? No, yeah. I mean, I, I know, know the name. Uh, it's, it's 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 the I think the the if if. Anything modularity related is like citing this paper. It's a bit like the Conway's Law thing, uh, uh, the Conway's Law um, okay. paper. Um, okay. But I, 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 we can look that up for for the show notes. I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Um, so, do you have any questions that you want to ask us? And you don't have to. It's just or anything a, we missed. Yeah, or anything we missed. Um, 
or may, maybe maybe also like for the for the audience um because uh, there's probably like people on the discord that that are <laughs> like listen to the episode later i yeah. mean the, the the thing that i'm currently like most interested in is like what strategies to teams apply to when they have to make all these decisions that we've discussed right when they mm. when they plan a, a new piece of software and um what are their their drivers behind a decision to like build a separate system or not right mm -hmm. um what is yeah, that how do teams um, think through that and yeah and do do they have a architecture team or something that they can go to and discuss that with or are they being told by an architecture team how to do it and i'm sure there's a huge variety of setups i mean there is this gap between um uh, like when you do like things like event storming right and you have that 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 wall of of post-its uh, and then you <laughs> kind of have to somehow translate that into when you get back to your computer you just some open up your ide <laughs> so there is a as i usually say post-its don't run in production unfortunately <laughs> except, except you work for Miro, then they then they do but um uh, there was an attempt once to run uml models and make that your production drawing and turning it into a program has been a yeah. holy grail for a long time and it all it they always go the last time i heard it was uml and they were going yeah we're We're ninety percent there. We just have to do the last ten percent, and then never heard from them again. Yeah, yeah. There is. I, I think Chris Richardson. You probably know yeah. him. Uh -huh. He recently. Po I have to look it up. Um, he recently posted some. Uh, he, he's formalized this into a, some kind of process where you basically you finished your domain analysis stuff, and then uh -huh. how do you get to the decision of what to build as a separate service and what to huh. build as modules yeah. within that separate service. That's we can, we can definitely yeah. look that up. Um, yeah. I don't find it right now, but yeah. It's, yeah. Anyway. I'm sure it's up on his website. Decision making in general okay. is something, fascinating. A something. I don't know. Oh. I have to, I have oh. to look this up later. Great. I'll go find it. Yeah. Anything else we missed? Oh, it's been pretty extensive discussion, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, very educational for me. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. All Happy right. to get well, some feedback on the Discord channel. Then. Yes, yes. Sure. Join. I guess we don't often talk about the Discord channel, and we should mention it that we do have a Discord channel. We do. It's always in the description of the podcast, and mm -hmm. if you want to discuss these things more, join us there. Yeah. Thanks, Ali. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Thanks, James, for having me. <laughs>